Welcome to the official tennis.com podcast featuring professional coach and community leader, Kamal Murray. Welcome to the tennis.com podcast. I'm your host, Kamal Murray, and we are here with um, the definition of vertical integration in the sport. Uh, a seasoned veteran in community tennis, junior development, college tennis, running a facility, and now running a pro event. Ryan Redondo, welcome to the show, bro. Thank you, man. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. So when I think of you, I think of me, right? I think of like, not you know, sleepless nights. I think of just begging for punishment, right? And <laughs> like one of the things that, you know, I think of vertical integration and all the holes in tennis and all the sort of dead ends right and where we see lots of participation but not a lot of graduation mm -hmm. right from level to level to level and i think that i've always been a proponent of in order to do it well you've got to do it all so you're the definition of that but so tell me how I mean, you and your family are like big into tennis and big big into tennis and uh, been into tennis in that san diego area so yeah. tell me about sort of your start in tennis and where your pedigree comes from because i started literally from the ground up no one of my family played tennis my my family's a basketball family yeah. uh and so we were just like figuring it out as we went along yeah but how'd you start yeah yeah well i guess if i have to give credit or respect to the kind of the lineage first of how tennis started in our family um grandfather came from the philippines navy family um here in san diego and uh my, my great-grandmother um, taking all nine of the Redondo kids, my dad, Skip Redondo, the oldest of nine, to Balboa Park. And, um, you know, they started at the park and rec kind of level. And she was very adamant about practice, discipline, and giving that to her grandkids. And that's where tennis started for the Redondos in San Diego. So Morley Field at the park. Um, and so, you know, I have to give credit to that park system because that's really back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, that's what got to me, from what I understand, tennis going here in America and, and booming, right? And so that's where it started. So I'm the, the son of, a, uh, you know, the oldest of nine. Um, they all played tennis. My dad, when I, when I was born, was the head coach at San Diego State. Uh, my Aunt Marita Redondo was, um, you know, a top player on the Virginia Slims tour, you know, battling Chris Everett, Tracy Austin, everybody, Martina. Uh, my uncle, Walter Redondo, Kalamazoo winner, top 150. So it's just in our blood of how we got to play. And, and um, I was a court rat, just played, hit on uh, garage doors, hit in the parking lot, um, hung around San Diego State my whole life as a kid, and, and then just started playing and competing myself. So you're in the midst of preparing now for an ATP 250 and a WTA 500. And you know, I, I look at like I think about your story starting in the park and now operating right important weeks for the tour. Right. That post U.S. Open pre Asian swing uh, yeah. and even during COVID, you know, the lack of an Asian swing like these sort of fall months became so important to the tour. Uh, we always like to say it created jobs. Right. Because pros, if you're not playing a tournament. You don't have a job. Right. So we yeah. sort of like high level job preservation for professional tennis players by having it. So I think it's remarkable how you got your start right to where you are now. Uh, and last year, I, the same weeks we were operating, right? The WTA yeah. 500 last year. And I just, I sort of know what you're in. Um, but tell me about your, your job as a college coach because junior career, great. You go and become a college coach. Cause I think that all kind of contributes to how you do what you do so well at this level. Yeah. Is growing up as a junior and then being three time West Coast Conference coach of the year in nine years. So tell me about that, right? Because I look at like I had Brian Shelton on the call a couple of weeks ago, right? Um, and we gave Ben Shelton a wild card into our 80K a few yeah. weeks ago. Um, so I'm fascinated by, you know, sort of a people getting into the college. So tell me about your college coaching experience and what made you so successful to get coach of the year three times. Um, yeah, thanks. So I, I believe it was when I was a player, right? So I think what got me to, you know, whether I was successful or not, but what the value that I brought in the college 
game as a coach was what I got out of my experience as a college tennis player. Um, discipline, kind of this mental freedom on the court, which translated into my everyday life. Um, I went through all the stages. I went from getting benched, right, as a freshman and not playing in the singles lineup to transferring, having this amazing experience uh, at San Diego State with Coach John Nelson, where we literally, you know, went from getting burned out to the first three weeks of practice were on a jujitsu mat. And I'm like, what's going on? Right. And I started to learn this whole different outlook on the game. And within a semester, won a national championship, won the national indoors and doubles. Right. And so I had these major kind of turn, turn of events as a player. You know, once I was done, I tried to play a little bit. I got a contract uh, in a lot of injuries. Anyways, got back and just said, you know what? I want to coach. I want to teach because that's what I felt happened to me. I want to get right. that back and uh, started at San Diego State blessed to go up to University of the Pacific in Stockton, California for nine years, nine and a half years. And um, when I was there, that's where I think set me up for what I'm doing now and kind of having the, the bandwidth to, you know, have an ATP event, but also I'm just as concerned about our junior aces, three and five-year-olds right now, actually, I'm stressed right. out about making sure they're taken care of um, because and that's program what, interruption during the tournament. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So when I was at in Stockton, you know, Stockton's number one, Great city, but very dangerous city, right? Hard hit, um, not, you don't think of tennis. But the boss I had, my mentor I had out there, Ted Leland, you know, he would always say, you're not just a coach, right? And so I just, I took that on and, and I started doing everything I could to grow the game of tennis from, I taught preschool in churches to um, lining blacktops on elementary schools to teaching the PE teachers how to teach tennis to getting them equipment through the USTA to bringing challengers to Stockton you know we had Francis Tiafo won his first challenger top 100 in Stockton California right so I got to do all these little things that then kind of gave me this awareness and and I still am still learning still struggling still failing at a lot of things you know personally about the job and stuff but it keeps me going to Kind of do these things that you're talking about which you know you get some successes along the way when you're when you're pushing forward now we talk about stockton right because i had a lot of pushback when we brought our pro events to chicago right and we're on the south side of chicago we're in the fourth port zip code in the city um but proximate to some very nice neighborhoods and proximate to some highways which allows us to draw from all around the city um yeah. but there was a lot of concern right around having a pro event in this neighborhood probably the same as you having a pro event in stockton yeah how was that process of convincing them that you could have this event hosted um without any you know sort of issues and problems or did you even get that oh yeah i had one of our uh, one of our tv crew media crew got held at gunpoint one night at the hotel right and so imagine that imagine that uh conversation getting pulled into the office from the supervisor Right. Um, I, I experienced it all. I mean, I saw it all, but when you work with people and you want to take care of people and you show that investment in, in taking care of them, you know, things, good things could happen. And so for us in Stockton for here, we're going to give you the best experience. We're going to take care of you. We're, you know, we're going to work on a level of transparency, honesty, and do our best. And I think that's how we got through with Stockton. And, you know, there's the business side to it too, right? You talk about jobs, right? The, you know, there's a whole swing in California and we added something when somebody, when Sacramento pulled out, you know, we stepped up. And I think, you know, when you step up to show uh, the powers to be in the community, like, hey, we're going to fill this in for you and we're going to grow it. I think that's how we're able to get through it. And I always just go back to the relationship side, you know, you know you're going to, again, you're not going to be perfect, but when you have good relationships, you're going to get through it. Yeah. So now you, um, what do you communicate to your players, right? Because being obviously winning conference or, or being three-time coach of the year, you know, and I was a I was a grad assistant coach at my school for a couple of years. And even now coaching a bunch of juniors, right? Yep. You are close to pro tennis, but probably even closer to junior tennis. And you always get the question of, I want my kid to go pro. I want this. I want that. I believe they can do this. Yeah. How do you handle that? Because I always, you never want to be the dream killer. Right. But since you've got one foot in both worlds, you know what a pro looks like. 
you know, the chances of becoming pro and earning a living as a pro. Yeah. Uh, and you know that perhaps some kids don't have it. How do you handle the question when people come to you because they know you know, hey, I want my kid to go pro. How do you how do you respond to that? Oh, man, that's a good one. I wasn't expecting that. But um, <laughs> I would say, gosh, I'm uh, going back to Ted Leland. We built a facility in Stockton, a brand new facility. When he cut the, you know, before the ribbon cutting ceremony, he goes, he asked me to speak and he goes, I want to welcome Ryan Redondo, my fellow dreamer. Right. And so I, I took that to heart. Like he sees that in me. That's what he is. And, and so I'm a dreamer. Right. And, and maybe to the, that might've been a negative for me in a place like Stockton mid major, whereas like I was dreaming of winning the NCAAs, you know, and I was pushing my guys, like, this is what we're doing. You know, maybe right. that wasn't right. <laughs> but what I could say <laughs> is I did bring a group of guys that were three-star recruits, four-star recruits looking at D3s to so, you know, getting on the tour, you know, I have a guy that's still hopefully going to break the top hundred this year. I had two guys, a sophomore and a junior get to the, to the finals of a hundred thousand dollar challenger. People were like, why are you recruiting that guy? Right. And so my message was, you don't, don't, you know, don't put anybody in a box. Right. I mean, I had a guy that was a three start on tennis recruiting, make it the semis of an ATP 500 in doubles, right. He's still playing. He's got wins over some of the best players in the world. Nobody was looking at him, right? So there's, I don't put people in boxes. So to, you know, to, yeah, I don't know if it was great, but I was like, I'm going to pull, I'm going to take them as far as their talent, as far as their potential, if they buy in as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, but then there's those real conversations of, hey, I think you should look elsewhere because if you want him to be a pro, this is where I think he's at. He's not making the starting lineup. You know, he, you know, there's other stages that he's going to have to get to. So a lot of conversation and, and just being super clear with the communication. But, you know, I really do believe I, you, you know, as a coach, like you want to take these kids as far as you can. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I also, one of the ways that I've begun to answer this is, all right, you're 12. Uh, in 10 years, who knows what the level is? Mm -hmm. It could be better. It could be worse, but stay in the game. Right. So I would say, like, when you look at the tour now, right, I, I think of, like, two eras. And Serena is, like, in, like, four different eras, three different eras, right? Um, she's in that Lindsay, Kana, Hingis, you know, just all of that, right? And now she's, like, sort of leaving this era. And when I look at her era, like, the, the meat of her era where you had Wozniacki, Serena, Sharapova, Lindsay was still there. Um, I look at that as like the Djokovic Federer like nobody can kind of break in and that level was so high yeah and I look at this era where there is a lot of hope because there is no clear-cut favorite there's a lot of opportunities for youngsters players are taking weeks off and perhaps there's a way to sneak in and make a living and I don't make sneaking in to be number one because you're not sneaking in to becoming number one yeah. in the world or sneaking into a slam but when I'm just talking about making a living, I feel like this era is the most possible. And I always say, who knows what tennis will be in 10 years? It could be a slump. There could be a two or three year drought in tennis at the time where you're peaking. And then perhaps that spirals into a decent career on a tour. So that's where I've begun to sort of like just steer people. Like, hey, you got a lot of work to do. Even if you just want to see A's, you still got a lot of work to do. Like Emma Navarro, great player, won NCAAs. Still got a lot of work to do, right? So the work is still in front of you. But who knows what tennis looks like in 10 years when you're ready to really make that consider. And that's where I've begun to not kill someone's dream, right? But just encourage the work. Yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? No, that's, yeah, that's powerful. It's, you, you're empowering them to continue on, right? And to continue to work and, and put the effort in. That's, I, I like that a lot. I think it goes to maybe talking to the parents too about, empowering them to stay on the right path as well right it's going to change yeah. on you know that's another that's another tangent about the right path for the kids but um i like that i like that approach. and, and tennis is opening up with roger rafa and djokovic kind of like you know maybe not djokovic but the other two kind of slowing down serena slowing down venus going out i mean like tennis is opening up right you know what i mean so there could be room for yeah. a new talent 
that maybe is not as talented as those big three. Yeah, yeah. And I know there's a lot of talk on the college level, right, of what, what the future of college tennis and stuff. But, I mean, the college platform, look at Ben, right? Look at Ben Shelton going in there and doing that. I mean, he's I, – I wanted him to come and play San Diego with a wild card, you know? I mean, he's just awesome. The guy he beat in the finals of uh, – the NCAA's August Holmgren from University of San Diego qualified last year or got through qualies, beat, you know, number 70 player in the world, first round qualies um, last year. And, you know, I think the college pathway is also another thing that's going to help possibly empower these kids to make that, that big jump too. So you're getting ready for a pro event, right? And you're at one of the, probably one of the most prestigious and infamous sort of tennis centers in the country, right? You're the site of the level one girls, super nats, um are you using kids from the academy as ball kids for the event oh yeah yeah, yeah. absolutely uh, ball kids and have you all over. yeah and have you all formed a ball kid academy as a result because when we first started doing these events right all i preached was this pro event is great for the see it's to be it model right i want this 13 or 14 year old kid who wants to play at ucla or who thinks she might want to play on a tour to stand in that corner and catch a wide serve that goes out, right? I want them to really sort of see it. Yeah. Uh, but they also got to be able to perform, right? So then that, that turns into a whole year-round ball kid training, one hour a week, right? Because, yeah. you know, there's a famous saying, the, the better the ball kid is, the less you notice them. Yeah, yeah. Right? They almost become invisible, you know what I mean? And so there is like a, a process and a skill set behind that. So have you all or will you all start to formulate a like ball kid academy so that these kids can become better at it, right? You will now. I love that. I love that. <laughs> I love that you guys are doing that. Um, and just the name alone, the ball kid academy, I mean, just to keep building that, you know, for us, the, the, we got the ATP last year as a result from, you know, the, the, the calendar, the holes in the calendar, same with the ATP this year, but the WTA event we have is in with partnership with Octagon. So this is a multi-year event. So an academy is great. We've been, we're really blessed to have um, an individual who's on our board here at U Tennis San Diego. Ron Marquez has been running any kind of pro event that we have. He's run all the ball kids, Indian Wells for years. So we have a good, strong coalition of, of kids and people that have been doing that. But I like that kind of consolidating them into this academy because there's so many different educational pieces that they can learn as well, kind of just thinking from what you just said. So thank you for that. Yeah, you can steal that one. I'm all about sharing. Thank you. <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> and, my, and my ultimate goal is to have one or two of those kids through, like you said, their relationships, go and be a ball kid at a slam. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like one or two where you get straight A's, whatever. You know, you make that phone call. Philip Brooke at Wimbledon, whoever, you know, whatever. Stacy, I got one kid from the inner city, you know, had four or five pro events of experience, right? At whatever, the 125 or 250 level. And, you know, they, I want them to have this opportunity. And through relationship, that's sort of my goal. That's right? awesome. To be able to take one of those kids and send them to Australia or send them to Wimby and, you know, sort yeah. of, sort of, that's that vertical, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome, man. I love it. All right. So tell me about your 250 coming up. Um, it's I, Really, this is an important part of the year. Who would you guys signed up? So we're really excited about some of the young Americans that are coming to play. We're, you know, from San Diego, Brandon Nakashima. Right? He's, Bina. Yeah, he is, uh, he's doing so well. Um, and uh, we're really excited about him. We gave a wild card to Keegan Smith. Uh, he's another local went to high school just down the road from the center, um, you know, played at UCLA, has a great story, you know, had a uh, almost, you know, you know near fatal uh, brain injury last year. Um, and he's come back. He's in the 300s right now, won a round with Nicholas Monroe um, at the U.S. Open and Dub. So we're excited about our young local guys. Um, Jensen Brooksby is doing great. So, you know, our, our top guy, Dan Evans, I think he's around 20, 22. Um, and uh, uh, but, you know, so our rankings are a bit lower than what you saw last year. I think we had seven of the top 10, you know, because yeah, we had like Grigor and yeah, we had everybody, Casper, yeah. Ruth, um, Nori. Uh, so 
the, the cutoff is lower, but a lot of those guys did really well in the U.S. Open. So we kind of have the future, as I see it, the future of tennis is coming this week or next week, you know, to San Diego, Galan, um, you know, the guys that beat the top seeds that, you know, beat Sitsipas. So we have all these guys that are kind of making their breakthroughs. I think eight of the top eight of the top 15 players in the tournament are career highs right now. So I'm excited about kind of the future of tennis coming to, to San Diego. Um, we do have like a Fernando Verdasco coming who, you know, the crowd loves him and guys beaten Djokovic, Nadal multiple times. So it's going to be a great event, great, strong tennis deadline for uh, the WTA 500 ended today. Um, so we've got, you know, I, I can see the list of who's coming. It's pretty spectacular. Um, yeah. so really, really excited. But, you know, the ATV event last year was so, was so great. And uh, the community here in San Diego is so great because they love tennis. I mean, San Diego is a tennis community. Yeah. So we're, we're pumped to bring this back for the, for the fans. Now, let me ask you about ticket sales, right? Because, you know, we've obviously worked hard to promote these events. And without the big name, right? Ticket sales can be a little bit tricky um, without spending a ton of money on VIP hospitality tent and like all the sort of bells and whistles that like a US Open or a Slam might have, right? You try to, I feel one of the things that we can do even at the, the 250, the 500, the 125 level um, is create experiences tangential to the tennis, yeah. right? To make it more like an event to get the tennis naive person to also come and fill the stands or fill the grounds with a grounds pass. Yeah. What have you all done different or interesting to try to A, sell tickets, right? Uh, and B, like make it more experiential versus just come watch B not. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Cause I think that's where we lack when you think about like the Super Bowl or NBA All-Star game or just even like NBA games. Now it's more of an entertainment experience. Yeah, exactly. And I think the more I would say U.S. Open is probably the closest thing to it being an entertainment experience. And yeah. you see how every year they're setting attendance records. But I feel like at the 250, the 500 level, we've got to do better at that. Yeah. Uh, what have you all done? Yeah, so our our hashtag, our tagline is better at Barnes. It's, and, you know, we're like, it's got to be the place to be, right? If you take some of these other events, like saying golf, um, sometimes they, you know, it's very similar to tennis. You don't know who's coming and you're trying to sell tickets. <laughs> Right. Right. That's the thing about tennis. Like you don't know who's coming and you're out there marketing and spending the money. And whereas you know when the you know when the Steelers, right, are playing the Patriots and people right. can buy tickets. So it's a little different. So with that, you've got to be the place to be. And you know, we're really lucky. Barnes Tennis Center, 16 acre facility, you know, we can expand and create this environment to be the place to be. So what that does too is you know, we, we do have the VIP area for food and beverage for, you know, and hospitality so that we can bring in those corporate sponsors that aren't supporting us now, but next year, that's the place to be. We got to help them. So we are creating those activations. We have a, what we're calling kind of the fan village where you can do your concessions um, and some experiential kind of practices uh, that any athlete can do, whether it's blaze pods, stretch lab, uh, physical therapy, um, you know, things that you can do. We have multi-ball where you can hit against this electric board, right? And you're actually playing. So it's creating those kind of events so that people want to come here. Um, and, you know, let's sell a grounds pass during the finals. You might not have a seat, but watch it in the concessions area. Go have some fun, bring the kids. Um, so we're doing, you know, I mean, we're throwing everything we can at it to, uh, right. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's a big part of, you know, we're a nonprofit, right? Barnes Tennis Center is owned by a nonprofit. The Southern California Tennis Association Foundation is the entity that's putting this event on. They're a nonprofit. So, you know, we're not the uh, privately owned events, you know, with uh, the big money behind it. So it's got to be, like you said, about engagements, selling tickets and those kind of things. So it's a lot of work, um, but you got to create that team that has the vision and, and the dreaming about it. And that's what we're that's what we're in doing, right? It is so, I don't know if you guys can hear it, but it's like, you know, hammers, nails, jackhammer going on outside right now. <laughs> yeah, I felt like when we were, when, we're, when we market our event, it's really hard to explain. You, you touched on it. Who's coming? Everyone says, okay, well, who's coming? And like, well, we don't know yet. Well, what do you mean you don't know, right? Is anybody going to come, right? Like, well, the, 
We cut off his hair. You know, we got a few wild cards, so we know who's coming from the wild cards, but everybody yeah. else is, we got to wait. And you can't really use their name till after the deadline. I mean, it's just like a whole process. And I feel because there are not a lot of events on American soil, right? To your point, very few people walk in a corporate sponsors, ask for support for an event and not have the answer to who's coming. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, you know, when the bears are playing, you know, what day they're playing, who, yeah. right? They're playing the pats on this. It's just easier, right? Where this is like, well, I don't know. You yeah. know, and last year we had Venus, Fidelina, Muguruza, Anjabu. I mean, we had Rybikina. We had everybody there. But eight weeks ahead of time, I couldn't tell you who was coming. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so exactly. that's something as if, I don't know how we do it without extending the cutoff because you don't want to have the cutoff to be 12 weeks ahead of time. Yeah. But I don't know how we as a tour help the promoter more yeah. know well, who's coming to try to monetize it. Yeah. I mean, a big part for us in these sales pitches and stuff is what we're doing right now. I mean, tennis, tennis channel. Right. You can start giving those data points, the metrics of this is how many people are watching. This is why it's so important domestically to get it on Tennis Channel. Right. Because now we've got the, the data and that's right. where you can go in. All right. The international feed for this ATP event, it's going into over 50 countries, it's going right into England. It's going right into the market that you're just expanded in and they're going to see your name on it. Right. And th so those are kind of the sales pitches. Um, it's not e like you said, it's not easy you know, the way it, it's set up, but um, to have platforms like Tennis Channel to really air us and put us out there um, to continue on every year, that's what that's what's going to help. And that's what's going to not save it, but grow it. Yeah. So when you think about um, the model right now, right, the sanctions are hard to get. Um, they're very expensive. Um, we see tournaments on and off the calendar, right? You have to, or it moves, or it's a lease, or whatever like that. Um, sometimes it'd be cheaper to allow people to create more sanctions instead of leasing them, yeah. right? I can take this couple hundred and invest it into the event versus investing it into the lease, right, or whatever. Yeah. What do you? You know, like what? What do you think? When you, I know there are like talks about restructuring the tour, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what do you think? I think helps or prevents us from having more events on American soil that are sustainable mm -hmm. at from the business level, and without like going into too much detail, right? Because we all have sort of yeah. an idea of what we can do better to open the market up. Yeah. so that we can grow the market. And right now the market is very closed, very tight. Yeah. There's only 52 weeks of real estate. Like I always talk about the terms as a property. Hey, we own that property. I'm like, what are you talking about that property? Well, we own yeah. that week. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I never thought about like that. Yeah, it's only 52 weeks, right? So it's 52 properties, right? Yeah. That are weeks that you want to occupy. So tell me what you, tell me what like the hard part and where we could grow. Ooh, yeah, those are, uh, uh, we can get deep into that. I can definitely- <laughs> on podcast, man. <laughs> but yeah, you know, I, I reference it that way too. Cause you know, we had it last year for one year and we never knew we were going to ever get a tournament back and people, the community, I, you know, I'd be walking through the park and somebody would say, Hey, uh, what, when is it next year? And I'm like, I don't know. You know, I'd have to explain it. And I would say, it's like a house. Like, you know, we're trying to rent one. We're trying to lease one, you know, ultimately we would like to buy one. And I know San Diego, I mean, the dream with our group is that we owned one here in San Diego. It's a great market, um, you know, and then, so you've got to find the ways to partner and, you know, we're really lucky to partner with Octagon, right. For the WTA. So that's how we got this one here. And, um, but, you know, there's gotta be some changes in, in setting it up so that, you know, North America, Mexico, Canada, you know, we can make sure that we see enough tournaments here, right. Our ATP event, we love it. We're going to bring it on no matter what. But we're up against Labor Cup, Davis Cup, and Mets all in Europe. So yeah. that's tough, right? And so we just have to continue to look at those things. I feel like both tours are in a, in a good place. They're, they're, the boards are forward thinking of how are we going to answer the question you just put out there. So I don't yeah. have those answers. You know, I just know, I know how we can grow the game of tennis by using these, these pro events. And I think we need to think more of, not just, okay, how much money 
how much is gambling going to make and, you know, the live streaming, the TV rights, but we don't have that unless the kids are playing, right? We don't have tennis unless we have kids, what you and I are doing, playing the game right now. And we have to have enough of them so that maybe the one or two goes on, right? And so we have to have a collective kind of consciousness to understand and that interconnectedness that we all have to have to have these events. And so when we talk about, we know that money is going to be a part of this, but we've got to holistically think about, okay, Asia needs this because we need more kids in Asia playing. North America, we need kids from Chicago. We need kids from Seattle, right? When, it, when have we seen something in the Pacific Northwest? We got to see these things so that kids play, that grows our game. So I know a lot about, or I feel like I, I have a passion for talking about that. Uh, yep. The other things that I don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'd like to come into a board meeting and talk about how to grow this game and and why it's important to have these events in san diego yeah yeah and because because if we don't we create a dead end we create a dead end. i mean let's just go into if we're talking about money let's go into tourism how many dollars are we bringing into this city that we won't see at all by bringing this event in right for the city so we can get into all of, i mean we can get we can go down every hole you want at yeah. how uh, impactful a professional tournament is on a city Right, not just on a soul, but a city as well. Yeah, and you know, I think that I always go back to the see it to be it model, right? I mean, people want to be Michael Jordan because they can. They got forty two chances in Chicago to buy a ticket. Yeah, right. I mean, it just is, right? They got a gym and a basketball in every school, and if we want to grow the game, we got to have more pro tennis, and we got to have more community tennis. Yeah, more tennis courts, more people that love it. But again, as we grow the game at the top, you grow the money that can trickle down to the bottom. And then you get better coaches, right? Because even right now as a tennis coach, it's a rewarding living, but it's not a rich living. And if we can make the overall sport be richer, we can make the sport be better, right? Yeah. And I think we all have this dream of seeing tennis be one of the top five sports in America as opposed to six or seven. Right. You got NBA, football, yeah, American football, baseball, volleyball. I mean, so much we're up against um, that if we don't grow the pot, we can't grow the trickle down. And like, you know, we can't compete with a two hundred fifty two million dollar contract that Mike Trout gets. You know, we cannot compete that and sell that to a kid. Right. What we're selling to a kid is, hey, you can go to Europe and play four or five tournaments and actually come back 20 grand in red. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's what we're selling. And we've got to, we've got to give us coaches at the ground level, something better to sell. Yeah. And they can say, you know what? I can use my tennis connection and go get a job on wall street, which is also great. Right. <laughs> that's also great. But that's sort of where we are now is this chicken and the egg thing. Um, yeah. yeah so I agree. That's, I'd love to like, help connect the people we know at the top to the struggle that we have at the bottom. Yeah. So that we you know, can one help. That one, and I'm going to give a shout out to Intercontinental San Diego because we started a relationship with them last year for the ATP event. And this is kind of shows the interconnectedness of what we're talking about from the top to the bottom and how they all relate, right? So we started, we got all the men down there. Um, the women's event is going to be the host hotel Intercontinental San Diego. So they, they come in. We started a program here in, in uh, January 1st, 2022, U-Tennis San It's called the Jump Program. So all junior circuit and level seven tournaments are free. Mm. So we do one a month, sometimes two a month, and no no entry fees. And I'm going to steal that. Intercontinental came in, and they are that, for this year, they are, they, they are the naming sponsor to that because they saw what we were doing. We've been doing it without their support you know, just small uh, sponsorships, you know, to try to offset those expenses to pay a tournament director to buy balls. Um, but what we saw is we have to limit the amount of entries we have now because hundreds of kids were coming from all over, you know, mm. and some from very wealthy areas, right? And they would say, well, we can donate or we can do this. And I would tell them, thank you. If you want to donate, donate. We're going to put it right back into our outreach programs or just go take another lesson or sign your kid up for another clinic. That's how we can help the industry. Intercontinental, we had a pro event, Intercontinental came in and saw what we're doing. 
saw some news things about it. We, we talked to them about it. I mean, we have hundreds of kids that are beginners playing tournaments now, right? And then, you know, all the stuff that happens once they start competing, creating friends, learning about competition, getting better, can competitively play, right? So that's that bottom, you know, foundation that we've got to grow and really, really fortunate to have, you know, that relationship from the ATP event come down to support that, you know, and oh. it's going to take a lot of work, but, you know, the, you know, I mean, you know, as a provided orange ball, red ball tournaments, you have to have them if you have these programs, but you try to send your kid to a $65 tournament that they get an hour of playing, they lose. Why, you know, as a parent, how could you continue to do that? Yeah. Yep. So better, this- better spend on the lesson, an extra lesson will go a lot further. So I'm going to steal that because I do think I have some sponsors that would underwrite, let's say, because we do a tournament every weekend. At our facility, we do a level seven or a level six every weekend. We got the boys level one over Thanksgiving this year. Um, but those level sevens, you're right. If I could get those parents to take that 65 bucks, put it into an extra lesson a week, right? Or extra, extra lesson a month, the game goes further. And that's a good option. I'm definitely stealing that. Um, I, 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 that- I've been talking to Martin Blackman about it and every, I mean, what we did too, and, and take this is uh, we had a $15,000 pro circuit event. We, on the day of the semis or finals, we ran a level seven. So you had the stadium court going, right? You had the stadium court going with the finals. We had all of 23 other courts going with a level seven. What do they do when they're done with their match? They watch, right? And now you have this little 10 year old kid holding his trophy, watching right. that match and, you know, looking at the future of our tennis. And so by connecting them, you, now you're helping the pro circuits that don't get anybody, even at the challenger level, you struggle. At the 250 level, you struggle and right. we're packing it, right? And so, you know, we're talking about, hey, use the kids, not use the kids, but use the, the platforms in these tournaments, right. use the kids levels to help support pro tournaments. Pro tournaments help support kids, interconnect them, right? And that's what we did in Stockton. Um, our, I remember our supervisor was Mike Liu and we told Mike, hey, we've got a level two boys 16s and girls 16s event during our challenger. Can we can we mix it? And he's like, that's a great idea. So we had Francis Tiafo play Noah Rubin. We had a, you know, we had the white fence. We had a boys right. and girls 16s match here. How I mean, how cool is that? You know, oh man. We have fans. So right. And extra question, you're right. As the court numbers dwindle from the quarters, the semis, the finals, now you got courts that open up. Players are gone. You don't need as many practice courts. That's brilliant. I'm definitely still in that. Yeah. Well, man, let me tell you, I know you got towels to fold, Gatorade to unpack. You know, I know you bought 2,000 towels and yeah. 6,600 bottles of sports drink, right? What did I forget, too? I got to go through. Oh, my God. <laughs> I forgot. I know. I'm like, you got towels, you got laundry bags, um, string and bun set up, the uh, water, the Gatorade. You got bars, you got bananas. Come yeah. on. We, you know, <laughs> yeah. It's all good. Oh, it's uh trust me I, I understand exactly what you're doing but i want to man thank you for taking the time to come on to the show uh i want to wish you luck with the event um you know those who are listening if you're in the san diego area stop on by um you know we need these events to be successful to continue the vertical um that connects to the bottom and creates inspiration for the kids that you know you serve at barnes and we serve here in chicago uh and i appreciate you do because i appreciate how hard it is so um you know, thanks for taking time to come on. And um, it's been a pleasure sort of getting to know you, you know, your story. And uh, I admire you for, for everything you're doing. Well, thank you. And vice versa. I really appreciate it. And I'm going to come out and visit you out there to see what you guys are doing so we can, you know, continue to grow in that vertical, like you said. So thank you so much for the time and uh, opportunity to uh, talk about what we're doing. All right. Thank you, guys. This has been a Tennis.com podcast. Um, Thank you for listening. Uh, we've had the pleasure of speaking with Ryan Redondo, the TD, out in the two San Diego, San Diego events, the 250 coming up men's and the 500. Thanks for listening.